Yeah, now for something totally different, <laughs> the center of our galaxy. Um, I've really enjoyed the, the, um, the last few days to learn about the bigger context, and what I hope to do in the next half hour is um, give you the context for the very center of our galaxy. Um, and we've made tremendous progress over the last 15 years since Back to the Galaxy 1. In fact, it was actually kind of fun to think about where we were in our knowledge, uh, uh, and in particular, our knowledge of the central dark mass concentration and the young stellar population around it. And there's no way I can do justice in um, half an hour to all the work that has um, gone on. But what I will focus on is um, the work that's um, really benefited from the advent of high resolution imaging techniques. Um, so in fact, um, at the time of the conference, just a few months beforehand, the very first speckle image of the Galactic Center was obtained. And we had no idea how exciting this field was going to become. And in the last few years, um, we've moved on to adaptive optics, which has just opened up this field tremendously. The work that I'm going to talk about from Keck has been done in collaboration with a lot of people. In particular, I'd like to point out um, my graduate students, Jessica Liu, who defended her PhD last week, and um, Tuan Do, um, a current student, and then a postdoc, Andrea Stolte, who's just moved on to the University of Cologne. All right, so there's a lot of um, uh, key questions that you can address with this ability to get diffraction limited images uh, at the Galactic Center. And just to give you um, a scale here, when you do this business, you gain yourself a factor of 20 in angular resolution. And so the first question that drove us all to, this exp to these experiments um, is the basic question of, is there a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy? And what I hope to convince you is that the answer is yes. Um, but this is interesting not only to know what is at the center of our galaxy, but also to understand how strong we can make the case for the existence of a supermassive black hole. Once we um, are convinced of the um, existence of this black hole, we'd like to know what its properties are, the basic things. Where is it? Does it coincide with the unusual source Sagittarius A star? What is its mass? How does it fit in with the n sigma relationship? Or as Scott pointed out, can we actually agree with different techniques about the mass? Um, so what do we learn about um, the reliability of velocity dispersion techniques for getting masses? Um, because in fact today what we're doing is getting um, complete stellar orbits, which is a much more direct measure of mass. And again, as Scott pointed out and has continually reminded us, um, if you believe that Sag A star is at the center of our galaxy, the distance to this um, object gives you um, the R naught, which is a fundamental parameter. Um, people, you guys who care about galactic structure should care about R naught. Um, so we may be able to give you a very precise value. Um, you'd also like to know um, uh, about the extended dark mass distribution in the form of either um, uh, particles or stellar remnants. Um, the orbits also um, get into a, um, a strong regime of gravity. So as our uh, measurement uh, precision increases, we have the test to test. We have the chance to test general relativity. I realized yesterday that GR is also gamma ray. So in my case, in this talk, GR is general relativity. Um, and then um, we'd also like to know whether or not we can measure the spin of the black hole. And there's a big question mark there for a good reason, which I'll show you later. Um, Again, center, studying the center of the galaxy also gives you an opportunity to study an, uh, an under-luminous accretion flow. Uh, and the center of our galaxy, the, um, the emission is only 10 to the minus ninth of its Eddington luminosity. So you have an opportunity to look in detail at the accretion flow. I'm not going to focus um, uh, much on this, but there's a whole lot of work that's been done on this. I'll just say a few words about the uh, emission. Um, and then last but not least, a problem that um, I, uh, I, I find particularly interesting today is to understand where the young stars um, uh, come from. Because in fact, those very young stars, which we knew, we've known about for a long time. So this is, this is an, an adaptive optics picture. Uh, and the scale here is 10 arc seconds on a side. You don't need adaptive optics to, to know that there are these bright blue um, stars. And these are wolf rayet stars. They were recognized. Um, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, wolf rayet stars are, uh, the progenitors are more massive than 20 solar masses. So the ages are thought to be just a few million years old. Um, and they reside from one arc second to 10 arc seconds or 0.04 to point, um, uh, 0.4 parsecs. And the fact that we saw this healthy populations of young stars at the galactic center I'm mean, basically at the time of Back to the Galaxy 1, people were arguing, well, there's no way there could be a black hole at the center of the galaxy because 
You can't get star formation near a black hole, so we know there are young stars. Shouldn't be a black hole there. <clears throat> Um, since that time, when we, uh, with the advent of ad adaptive optics, we've recognized a separate population of stars that are presumably quite young. These are the, um, the B stars, and these stars exist, coexist with the wolf rayet stars, but also extend um, much closer to the black hole. So they extend all the way inwards. In fact, the population of stars that we're going to use as test particles to test for the existence of a supermassive black hole are basically all B stars. Um, <clears throat> So again, um, let me just go through the uh, argument, which probably many of you have heard, but some of you have probably not heard. The reason the existence of the, uh, these young stars um, argues against the existence of a supermassive black hole is that if you want star formation to proceed, you need um, density, gas densities that are high enough to overcome the tidal shear of the black hole. Of course, this is going to depend very strongly on your radius. It's 1 over r cubed. But if we just take one arc second, which is where the, de uh, where the wolf ray stars are, uh, are most prominent, um, you need gas density of 10 to the 11th particles per, cu uh, per cubic centimeter. Okay, so then you can ask, well, what do you see there? Well, you don't see much. Um, in, in this region, um, you see less than um, 1,000. Um, if you go outward to a parsec, there is a nice ring um, of, of gas where the densities might get up to 10 to the 7th, although you can make several people in this community quite upset if you suggest that it's actually 10 to the 7th. Most people will, will, are comfortable with 10 to the 6th. So you certainly, in the, in the closest regions where we see the young stars, so they're all inside this circum, circumnuclear disk, you don't see anywhere near these gas densities. And if you go all the way into where you um, see the B stars, um, you basically get a, um, uh, in, an inconsistency that's um, a 10 to the 10th um, uh, discrepancy. So it's not just a little problem, it's a big problem. Nonetheless, let's not let the idea or the theoretical idea that star formation doesn't happen in the vicinity of a black hole prevent us from looking. And of course, since we're in our galaxy, we have the best case to look at. Um, so we need to show that the mass is confined to a very small volume, and we can use um, either the gas particles or the, uh, or as, uh, sorry, either the gas or stars as test particles, and we can go about this in two different ways. Either we can look at velocity dispersions, I like to call it the, the impatient uh, technique, or the pre-tenure technique, I don't have a lot of time, so you just um, either look at the line of sight, or you, uh, in, in the case uh, of these, uh, the early speckle experiments, you look at the proper motion on the plane of the sky, and get um, and use the projected mass estimators to go from velocity dispersions to masses. And we've heard a lot about this at this conference um, in the context of the ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. And I find that discussion really interesting given um, uh, the trouble we even have with a lot of data um, going from velocity dispersions to masses. Um, if you have patience, or if you have tenure, you can do these, um, these experiments that might take you an insanely long time to do. Okay, so this, um, this uh, the seeing limited measurements of the gas um, gave the first hint of the central dark mass concentration. So here we have velocity, uh, sorry, enclosed mass as a function of radius, and these are velocity dispersion uh, measurements taken from line of sight um, uh, measurements. Um, so they go out from uh, the, the, the hydrogen, um, hydrogen uh, disk uh, all the way into the circumnuclear disk that I was showing you earlier and in, uh, uh, inwards. And the really exciting measurements were made by in the late 80s, uh, which suggested that there was a, um, a concentration of dark mass. And the way you get that from this plot is that the dotted line here um, is how much mass is locked up in the stars, assuming some constant mass to light uh, ratio. And this is the first time that the velocity dispersion was above that inferred from the stellar population. Okay. But there was lots of um, uh, questions uh, about this. And the, and the main issue here was that um, with seeing limited observations, you can infer a, de a dark matter density of 10 to the ninth solar mass per cubic parsecs. This is because you're about, I don't know, um, tens of thousands of uh, short shield radii out, so you're nowhere near the event horizon. So then you have to invoke um, indirect um, arguments. So you have to ask, well, how long could a cluster of dark objects, like stellar remnants or otherwise, live, and they could live for a uh, time scale that's larger than the uh, um, age of our galaxy. So they were permissible, 
Um, and then after these observations, there were lots of creative alternatives suggested by the particle physicist um, in the form of a fermion ball, which is kind of like a neutron ball, uh, a neutrino made of fermions. And to make progress, you need high resolution uh, imaging techniques, which is why um, uh, two groups um, kind of jumped in on, on this in the uh, early to mid 90s. Um, so the first experiment was done at the NTT starting in 1992, and then the second experiment was done by my group starting in 1995 at the Keck Telescope. And this is just a kind of fun thing to show you. This is real data. And we, we like to show you the animations of the nice cleaned up where the stars go, uh, but this is the central arc second of our galaxy. And what you can see here are the stars that dominate our knowledge of the central potential, but you can also see how hard this is. <laughs> um, so um, this star in particular, we're going to focus on SO2. It goes around in 15 years. Um, but you can see you're really struggling, and you can only see the, on the brightest few. Um, but what's really exciting here is where we are today. So this is the same field of view use, uh, using adaptive optics. Uh, you can see that we have a much shorter baseline, but the quality of the, um, the data is just um, much higher. And I should note with both of these images, these are just images. They're not deconvolved. They're what you, they're what you get once you clean, you know, just flat field. And uh, so there's, there's no cleaning here. Um, this star here is SO2. And what you can see is there's a wealth of other stars there, which is both a blessing and a curse, <laughs> as you'll see. So lots of other test particles, but this means that there's a tremendous number of stars which are um, in, uh, basically becoming blended at different times with the stars that you want to trace. Andrew, just yes. to clarify that, sometimes when the line-up shows you this, it looks afterwards that you've got clean tracks, you know, you put back in stars with a little bit of moving on the track. I'm going to show you what uh, the so PR version is. Really this is just morphing images. This is, oh yeah, let me, I, that's what I was trying to give a sense of. This is, this is the data. There's no modeling here, except that we've registered the images and, um, and done a, a, a morphing between frames. So this is, this is the, the data. Oh yeah, <laughs> okay. I can, I can say a lot about absolute astrometry or the ability to do astrometry. And when I got into this, I used to think astrometry was just incredibly dull, and this, these discussion of reference frames would put me to sleep. And now I care a tremendous amount about it because, in fact, it's one of the limiting factors in this business. The way we do this, what I'm not showing you is the whole field of view. We have a 10 arc second field of view with 6,000 stars, and we assume that those 6,000 and all 6,000 stars move. So we have to. So what we do is we have to assume that. There's no net motion in that population. So you basically register them by minimizing the net displacement. So you allow for translations, rotations. We do a full first order. We don't do anything higher because you can get into some funky things if you do that. Um, but that's how we register. We leave out anything within the central arc second because, do, uh, uh, because everything outside is moving with linear motion, so it doesn't induce distortion by doing that. Now, there's, there's a couple caveats. One is there's a young population in here that I've introduced and I'll come back to. That has net motion. You have to take them all out. If you don't, you induce some interesting pheno phenomena. So um, I'm going to come back to this since you've introduced this um, when I talk about the uh, possibility of companion black holes. So remind me to, do, um, to address that. Okay. So love it. I love AO. Oh, and I guess I'm, I want to do another PR thing here, which is um, adaptive optics has had a long, difficult history. The first uh, uh, adaptive optics run I went on was 15 years ago. But the first time I gave up speckle imaging was two years ago. So that's when you know that I actually bought into this technique. It really works. You go to the telescope, um, and um, the laser is not your limiting problem. So that's just my PR. Think about it if you have a problem that can be addressed with adaptive optics. The aspect of this that I'm um, um, particularly excited for this experiment is the astrometric precision. So not only are we seeing much fainter, but before we were basically struggling along, or we thought we were doing great, with one milli arc second astrometric precision. And now we're at um, 0.15, um, so 150 micro arc seconds. That's an order of magnitude improvement. And there's a whole host of different problems that you can go after with that improvement. In fact, listening to the talks over the past few days, I've been fantasizing about what one could do maybe on these dwarf galaxies. Um, so, but you need bigger fields of view. It's much harder. 
OK, so this is the PR version of that um, image. There's no data here. There's only modeling. OK, so this is the thing that we usually look at. Um, but it does tell you, um, and, I'll, and I'll come back to how the model fits the data in a moment. Um, so this is a 15-year period, um, guy going all the way around. This plot has become much more complicated since the advent of adaptive optics, because there are stars I couldn't see with speckle, and I can see with adaptive optics. So lines are dotted if we don't have data during um, that epoch. And then they become um, solid when we do have measurements. So you can see both our extrapolation into the future, as well as stars that weren't detected in speckle and then are picked up now. This is actually just the easy ones to find. There's many more um, that, we're fi we, that we are tracking um, that I'm not willing to show you yet because it's going to be online. <laughs> My competitor has a habit of finding them after I show them. OK, so um, um, even though we have all these stars, and you can, uh, oh, I should have said one more thing. Let me go back. Um, even though we have all these stars, um, and the model that I'm fitting here is assuming um, a single point potential in the middle. So in, in other words, everybody has, uh, is orbiting the same, uh, the same dark mass at the same location, and we even let the um, black hole move. Okay. But nonetheless, while you can get all those orbits, if you really want to know the properties of the central black hole, SO2, the guy that goes around in 15 years, is the only one that matters. The reason it's the only one that matters is because it has the shortest orbital period of only 15 years, and it's the brightest, so it's least affected by the fact that you have all those other stars, which are a real problem. In that animation, you can see the, um, the blending that occurs. And in fact, you don't even need the animation to tell you that. Um, and again, this is, this is the data. Um, this are the data. Um, so 95, you can see 98 here. SO2 crossed with another star. You can see it coming up and you can see it coming out, so you don't need to, um, to rely on the fit. But even in the fit, you see that these are astrometrically biased, and the bias varies as a function of time. The bias that's actually most unfortunate, again, it's a, it's a plus and a minus, um, we see Sag A star these days in the infrared. We see Sag A star, that's at, uh, that's at, your, um, at your dynamical center. The, uh, our resolution is 50 milli arc seconds. That means at closest approach, these things are blended with a black hole that's variable, so it's very hard to correct for that. And these actually are a dynamically really important points. Okay, so we also get radial velocities now that we have adaptive optics, and the radial velocities are quite impressive. It goes um, basically at closest approach, you have a change of about 6,000 kilometers per second. These are units of thousands of kilometers. Um, so in fact, um, this was an early, really bad data set that we couldn't find the line because we didn't know what we were looking for. We didn't know what kind of star it was. We didn't know the properties of the black hole. We got it at closest approach because this is when the AO system was working better, and we went back in hindsight. It's too bad because, of course, it, had we known, this is the year that you, we, you would have just hammered away like crazy at it. So we got to wait. We got to wait till 2018. All right, but we have patience. All right, if you want to know the mass of the black hole, this is our current mass. We actually published it, so this is what we're, we're sticking by. Now, um, oh yeah, so if Scott were still here, um, he would give me a hard time, I'm sure, because um, our errors have gotten, our, sorry, our measurements have gotten more accurate, but less precise. It's because I think we've gone from the teenage years to the grown-up years, um, because we used to state very emphatically what the mass was <laughs> with tiny error bars, and now we understand much more about our systematics. So I've given you two sources of an error here. Um, this, is, uh, this extra source of error is if you're not willing to fix the black hole along the line of sight. A lot of people are willing to say that it's probably not moving because the cluster is not, uh, uh, looks to be at rest with respect to the uh, local standard of rest to within five kilometers per second. But if you don't take that as a prior, and that's important because if you want to look for these intermediate mass black holes, you shouldn't take that as a prior. So if you let that be a free parameter, which is what we've done, then you have to assume or incur a bigger error. So these two things then have to be added. Our, the way I've reported it here for you guys is that you would have add this in quadrature. Anyway, this is, it shouldn't be, which is why I don't do it. There, there, are, there are other groups that will report it fixed. And it's also what's been done in the past. Because it's simple and you get a precise answer. So I guess my message to you is you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't, oh, and that, this is my cue actually uh, to come back to Leo's point. I was, gonna, I was gonna skip over this. But there's velocity in three dimensions that you have to worry about. The line of sight, 
um, will come in, will come in here. That's just an offset up and down. But you'll have to also remember that our time baseline for velocities, uh, radial velocity is much shorter than the astrometry. So in fact, that's where our biggest uncertainty comes from. But here, you actually have to do it even if you believe that the velocity of the black hole is at rest, because uncertainties in your reference frame will look like motions in your black hole. Okay, so when we have this velocity, it's a, it's a, what we measure is a velocity with respect to our reference frame, and you don't actually know which one's which. So you have to do that. That's why I've incurred that part of the error over here. But the line of sight stuff, you have a choice. It depends on your, your, your tolerance for these assumptions. I don't have a big tolerance for them, so I, I'm going to incur it. That doesn't affect your average value at all. It does. But still at 4.1? No. Okay. It's going to be 4.5. It goes up actually to 4.5 and 8.5. Um, uh, so it basically makes a one sigma in these units error. <laughs> so there's, and this is a systematic effect. And in fact, you can see exactly what's going on here. Um, so um, the dominant source of uncertainty is this uncertainty in the line of sight velocity. This gives you the distance as a function of that velocity, so in your solutions. So you can see it's our dominant source of error. And then the mass that we get um, is a highly um, degenerate with the, the distance. So in fact, so, and these fits are um, over here, so letting the, the velocity be a free parameter. Okay. Yes. Um. You're asking where does um, the radio VLBI measurements with respect to background quasars come in? How can I how can I either take advantage of it or, and how does it relate? Okay, so there's two two ways. One, so just to back up a second, there's a wonderful experiment that's being done of SAG A star, which is a radio source measured with respect to background quasars. And what you see in that experiment is um, a beautiful linear motion, and that's due to, primarily due to the sun going around the center of our galaxy. So the way this can couple in here is if you know the distance to the galactic center, then you get theta naught from combining these two experiments. You actually can't get R naught directly from that experiment. So Oh, well, this, I, was, I was debating about throwing this in. So um, you see a line in the radio measurements that's not quite lined up to the galactic plane. So then you have to decide whether or not you're going to learn about the, the black hole with respect to the galaxy or whether or not you've learned something about the galaxy. So it's degenerate. And that's why I, so you, if you assume that it's not degenerate and you know, then, then you do get um, limits on black hole companions, which I'll, I'm going to come back to in a second. Actually, I'm going to. One more quick question. Why would, why? Uh, let me just interrupt here. She's only got like five minutes left, so maybe we could just table the rest of the the, the, talk, the questions for the question session. Okay. Um, let's come back to it because I do want to address that. Okay, uh, five minutes. Um, so the the one message that I want you to have from this is that now with the dark the, from the, this measurement, you have a dark mass density that's up at almost 10 to the 16th solar masses per cubic parsec. This is an increase in density of 10 to the seventh. This is um, the higher you are, the more believable your black hole is. So the message I want you to take away is that there's only three um, black hole cases that are credible because they're above the green line. This is that the lifetime is shorter than the age of the universe or something like that. Um, but you're way up here. Okay, so I'm going to start to be incoherent because now I'm nervous about finishing. Um, we don't agree with the velocity dispersion with um, method. It's higher. I'm going to skip that. You can ask me about it. Um, the things that I do want to emphasize is that um, from the orbit, um, you can limit the extended mass distribution. And this extended mass distribution can be in the form of dark, uh, dark matter particles or in stellar remnants. Both of them are supposed to be there. There are predictions, lots of predictions. And you get about a thousand, the prediction is about a thousand solar masses. And our limits are about a factor of a hundred times larger. So you're not going to get the answer yet, yet. Okay, the other thing that you're going to get from this is um, the companion mass black hole. Hans Walter, I'll, ask you, I'll answer your question after the talk about the, but we have a limit, which is about 2 times 10 to the fifth solar masses at a distance of 0.1 parsec. 
And of course, this depends on radial distance. In this community, there's a big debate about whether or not this cluster is, has an intermediate mass black hole. As you heard yesterday, there's a nice poster about the thought of intermediate mass black holes dragging things in. Okay. There's going to be a huge improvement with time. This is like a fine wine. You just have to be patient. Okay. But stellar confusion. I've told you at the beginning that 0.15 um, milliarc second is our precision. But because of this confusion, SO2, which is uh, the brightest one, is actually limited to a half, uh, half a milliarc second. In other words, you've got about a factor of five, four or five times worse just because of that stuff running around behind you. So if you really want the full, uh, full potential of AO, you need a bigger telescope. So that's my next message. You need a bigger telescope. And if you can get a bigger telescope, not only can you overcome this, but you can get a precision, and I won't call it R-naught anymore. I'll get to call it the distance to the black hole that's less than 0.1% accuracy. You can actually measure the relativistic prograde precession from general relativity, and you'll be, actually, uh, you'll be able to see this extended mass distribution as predicted. So I, I'm a big fan of big telescopes. Um, all right. The other message I want you to take away from my talk is that there's been a lot of hoopla um, in this community about whether or not there's a 20-minute QPO in the uh, variability of the infrared emission from Sag A star. Okay, so this was the original result. This is Sag A star infrared emission. This is the power spectrum. You see a peak at about, actually it was 17 minutes in the original report. And um, if you believe that Sag A star is a non-spinning black hole and this emission comes from a blob at the last stable orbit, the last stable orbit is at about 30 minutes. The fact that it's a shorter period tells you that there's a spinning black hole. Okay. So um, more recent um, work, which um, takes advantage of the higher strells and the higher stability from the laser guide star AO system, um, and lots and lots of data, um, shows that this actually is consistent with a pure red noise. It looks just like AGN. The only feature we see in this is at about three minutes, which is our dither pattern. And in fact, these are Monte Carlo simulations of what you get from red noise that's comparable to what you see in um, AGN with power laws from one to about two and a half. And you see that, that, that little spike there. So anyway, there's, there's no 20-minute there's no QPO that's um, statistically significant. Okay. We need to understand the young stars. Let me just end with saying uh, that there's three explanations. How many minutes do I have left? Zero? Okay. There are three explanations that people love. There's been tons of works in, in this field. Um, basically, it comes in three, uh, three flavors. Uh, maybe they're old stars masquerading as youths. There's, pretty, uh, there's um, pretty good evidence that these things really are massive. You can't get away with this. There's the other idea that you have them form far away, so you don't have the tidal force problem, and then you have to put them on an express bus, which means that you have to invoke things like intermediate mass black holes. And again, there's a po nice poster out there um, showing the current work on, in modeling this possibility. So if you do invoke an intermediate mass black hole, you can bring them in. But they shed um, stars all over the place. And last but not least, you can say that they formed in situ. Um, let me say just two things about that. Um, looking at the clusters that are, in, uh, that are out there that could potentially infall, um, our work uh, led by Andreas Stolte has shown that the, they're not on orbits that are going to deposit them there. We're looking for an intermediate mass black hole in there, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and then in terms of this in situ idea, this is the main result. These are, now we can measure the orbits of stars at much larger radii, and this is important because you need to get outside one arc second for the black hole not to basically erase the signature of um, the, the original orbit. Doing so, if you get lots and lots of orbits, which we now have for these young stars, what this plot shows you is the direction of the normal vector, or the angular momentum of the, of the young star, this is the density of the normal vectors. So if everything's in a disk, or, um, then they, uh, line up to a single point. So there's very clear evidence that, that half of the young stars um, have a common direction for their angular momentum vector, so are, are in a single plane. Um, and again, you know, every field has its um, uh, debate. There's been a big debate in this field about whether or not there's one disk versus two, and from this orbital analysis, um, there's only evidence for one, and that half the, uh, the rest of the population seems to be in a much more isotropic population. And within that disk, it falls off as 1 over the uh, r squared, which is consistent with the idea of disk fragmentation hypothesis. Although it's clear that the geometry has to be much more complicated than just a simple disk because you've got that other half. So the other half is a big, big question. So uh, what do I want to say? In conclusion, this is what you should remember. There's a big black hole. This is the mass. There's a lot of systematics that you have to take account for, so the, mass, the uncertainties are much larger than previously reported. There's no evidence for a 20-minute QPO. Um, star formation does appear to happen in situ, 
near a black hole. And I think that's one of the more exciting results. Um, this uh, uh, epoch of star formation was only um, a few million years ago. The next talk will um, uh, show you evidence that maybe there was earlier epochs in the form of the hypervelocity stars. And I think there's a really exciting future um, in this business um, of measuring orbits where maybe we can test general relativity, look for the extended dark mass distribution, and um, we're going to have to be creative to get it spin. I don't know where we're going to get that from. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks. So let me actually start with the people I interrupted. So uh, did you want to still ask your question? Or? Okay. Okay, we'll start with Andy here. Um, how come you didn't mention the actual method of uh, young star population, which is resonant relaxation? Because I only had 30 minutes. <laughs> um, but Andy, thanks. Um, so... There's this business of resonant relaxation, um, which, will, which means that within a, the central arc second for stars that are only a few million years old, you're not going to see the original um, uh, direction of the, org, uh, the angular momentum vector. That's why you need to get outside the central arc second. And in fact, if you looked at the number density profile uh, that showed the fall off as um, 1 over r squared, you could see that inside an arc second it was starting to fall off, and that was that interaction. But that was provide uh, Yes, there's a whole there's a whole thing that Andy's actually done a lot of work on that relates and, and it's the perfect connection between my talk and Warren's talk. So that we have these hypervelocity stars. Um, but you need to get if, if you if you if you want to form these young stars out at large radii, and here you have to get a little bit careful about which population of young stars you're talking about, the Wolfram stars or the B stars. Um, you can send them on uh, radial orbits uh, as a binary and have a three-body interaction. Kick one out, keep the other one. You need real, you need the leftover ones to be highly eccentric. And the other result that I didn't have time to, to, to add to this talk is that we ha um, we now have quite a healthy population of orbits in the central arc second, and they're not they're not biased to high eccentricities. And the numbers are still small, but there's plenty of low eccentricity systems. That's yeah. Oh yes, right. Okay. Hi. Um, what would you need to separate uh, lensing from the confusion to get an independent determination of the mass? Yeah, the, um, the, the, the possibility of doing lensing is an interesting idea. And again, Andy's done a nice paper on of this. So if you take Andy's number and his, uh, the, the papers, uh, those, that set of papers, um, it's highly unlikely that this experiment should result in a lensing event. Of course. That should never stop an observer. So this is um, just uh, one of those experiments that needs to be done. It was done with the early speckle results to. That's why I asked you what would you need. Oh, you mean what would I need in the future? Yeah. Well, I guess I guess actually I hadn't come back to that question. Uh, for the TMT, whether or not we would be in good shape with the TMT, uh, or some variation of that. Yeah. 23rd. Andrea, can you repeat that? Fine. We didn't hear that in the back. It's 23rd. It's a magnitude limit problem. So we're not there yet. I was trying to remember that, that, that magic number. So it's 23. And I think with TMT, you could get, get to it without being overwhelmed by confusion. OK, thanks. Uh, I was wondering how you get around the tidal force for self-gravity argument you had at the beginning for in situ stars. Oh, well, you have to invoke um, a lot of gas there in the past. So then you have to ask, where did that gas come from? And that's where the, that's where the problem still resides for the, for the, the galactic center. Although there was a nice, um, there was a nice uh, paper by Bunnell and uh, Rice that came out in uh, Science last month that suggested you could have these eccentric um, clouds uh, come in and fragment and deposit the stars. So maybe you could um, have them come in from a parsec. So the debate now is, where are these clouds coming from? Uh, Andrea. If do you have any evidence or limits on the binary population? And uh, from the orbits that you have, these now uh, increased number, uh, any stars going to be coming in uh, close like S0 to, uh, or that other one that's on the highly eccentric orbit? Yeah. Um, so this is a question of binarity. Um, Binarity is an interesting question both for the, um, for the hypervelocity star discussion as well as for the 50% of young stars that aren't in the, in the disk at larger, uh, larger radii. Um, getting a binarity turns out to be really tough. Um, so there's, 
two, two or three cases that are known today. One is an eclipsing binary, and again, and, um, one is uh, uh, just has variability ca characteristics consistent with a colliding wind. Um, so that's and given the number of stars we see, that's consistent with what you see out uh, out 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 here in the suburbs. Um, <laughs> So it, it's hard to, it's actually hard to design an experiment to get at it because these stars, the, ma the more massive ones, have these huge outflows. So you're not going to do it with radial velocity. Um, so one of our ideas is that if you really have this precision, you could actually do it astrometrically. Um, so that's that's a possibility. But it's a really interesting question. Andrea. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. The question is, the question is how many um, of the stars that are in short period orbits are binaries? No, are, are coming in very close to the Oh, yes, and this is another thing. There's a, there's a whole section of this business that I just threw out because there was no way I could explain it, um, <clears throat> which is what, what are the interesting um, parameters or common parameters about the stars that are inside the central arc second? And the one that, uh, that I find most interesting is that their apoapse distances tend to be quite comparable and co quite comparable to the inner, um, the inner edge of the disk. So then you have to ask whether or not the one arc second, which seems to be the inner edge of the disk, is a relaxation process or something physical. Andrea, you showed that with your new data that it's unlikely that whatever makes the black hole flicker is a blob just going around the last stable orbit. But I would presume that it's something slightly further out. Can you comment on what the next generation interferometers such as gravity, etc., might tell you about the nature of what makes things flicker? Um, let's see. Let me do. For, I'm, going to, I'm going to do two things. First, I, I forgot to mention that this this work that we have on the flickering just came out on AstroPH today. So if you want to see that work, that go check out AstroPH. Um, the second uh, to ask answer your question about what we hope might hope to learn about the flickering. There are um, two experiments that are um, two interferometry experiments. One gravity at the VLT, and then the other is Astro with the Keck interferometer that should be able to um, resolve things blobs. Uh, very close to the uh, event horizon. And the hope is actually to see the astrometric uh, signature um, in these blobs. The challenge in both, uh, for both of these experiments is you have to ask how long are these things going to survive for and, and how much are they going to change? If you look at the MHD simulations of blobs coming in, it gets complicated fast and the lifetimes of these blobs don't last very long. So I think there's some hope, but it's, it's complicated. Okay, so even if Martin isn't interested in the answer to his question, I'm kind of interested. So, because um, the distance galactic, the distance galactic center is very important, right? So, yeah. so what's what are the sort of estimates for how far the black hole could be from the distance of the galactic center, or do we just have no idea? Um, well, all are. If you think that it's just a single black hole. Uh, then you can invoke Brownian motion arguments, uh, which would argue that it's very close. If you start to think about the possibility of black holes merging and giving each other... What is very close? Oh, um, let's see. It gives you... Um, let's see. I think it was... Um, the motion would be uh, three kilometers per second is the Brownian motion that you expect um, from just the, what else is around there. Um, but then you have to worry about what else could be there. I mean, if it is if it is a binary, it could be more offset. If it's merged and it's get, been given a bigger kick, you could get a different answer. And from this meeting, I've learned that there's a whole host of other reasons <laughs> about why it could be offset. And I'm not sure how we would ascertain this, except by maybe comparing, you know, large-scale gas, maybe. Well, the VLBI tells you something important. Because he's got a reflex motion. Uh, essentially in one direction. I didn't know that there was some offset from the galactic plane now from, from that. Well, motion. it's always been there. I mean, they just argue that we should redefine the galactic plane. Well, okay, but the, the thing is you have no motion in latitude, and the motion is only in longitude. Yeah. So you'd have to, uh, given the fact that we think we have some limits on what theta naught is, I mean, you're measuring omega, omega naught, the angular velocity around yeah. the center. So um, I think... Uh, that should put some limits. I don't know if it'll make any improvement, but it, it'd be very hard not to have uh, this thing very close to the center. If it's the exact dynamical center, it's, it's probably still open. 
Right. But there's degeneracy. Yeah. This is just a follow up on that. In yeah. 2018, there'll be two dimensions of doing that. So, so the one dimension could be by chance, but two dimensions will tell you that it's not moving. It's when you have the RV for the black hole. Keep us going till 2018. Uh, yeah, so uh, for us who don't have tenure, so our patience is still limited. Um, can you comment on that nagging factor of two discrepancy between uh, dynamical measurement uh, of black hole mass and uh, the uh, velocity dispersion method? Um, why, why it has come? Yeah, well, there, I mean, there's, just what there's are your the thoughts? usual um, arguments. You have to make assumptions about the number density distribution the level of um, the, the orbital distributions. And you also have to assume that you've measured the whole stellar population. And in fact, in the case of the Galactic Center, I think that was the biggest problem. And, and, a, and the fact that there's more than one type of uh, population that aren't in the same dynamical state. So as we correct for all these different effects, or try to correct for them, the, the, they're coming into better agreement. Okay, very quick question here. So you mentioned, uh, Andrea, that uh, you could be eventually sensitive to the uh, inner cusp of the dark matter in, inside around the black uh, around the black hole. How do you do that? Um, it's just a gravity. You look for the orbit not being closed. So if there's an extended dark mass uh, distribution, um, you'll see the orbits open up. Uh, how, but then but you have. How close are you to do that? Uh, we right now, we're off by a factor of 100 compared to the yes. current predictions about what should be within the orbit of SO2. So we're just using the orbit of SO2. SO2 goes from 100 AU to 2,000 AU. So the fact that it's an eccentric um, orbit allows you to probe it. Um, and you have to wait till it's very close? Actually, in that, it, both close and distant points are important. So you have to understand the orbit in detail as it goes all the way around. Um, you need point one milli arc second precision to get down to the level predicted. So you need to overcome the stellar confusion to do this with the orbital dynamics. Okay, I think we should move on. So let's thank uh, Andrea again. Okay, so our next talk will be by Warren.